Good morning. Maybe you better than anybody can appreciate what happens when you wear hearing aids and you have one of these microphones and you have glasses and then you add COVID, COVID masks to that. <laughs> and you take your COVID mask off and then everything just falls on the ground. And so I'm, I'm one short of maxing out because I don't have the mask on. <laughs> but I do have the hearing aids and the glasses and the, and the microphone and, and all of those things. Two words have uh, been common in my vocabulary since the end of last year when Tim called me, and that is uh, humbling honor. Now, in the world, that's, a, that's an oxymoron, a humbling honor, because if you're honored, then it's not humbling, it's you build your pride up. But for Christians, we understand what a humbling honor it is. Stuart and Cecilia are Christians of great vision and faith to see the need for a program such as Senior AIM, back when there was no such thing as a program for Senior AIM. The Romans were very wise until they started hiring mercenaries to defend their country and then they weren't so wise, but they would give their soldiers, when they retired, they would give them a tract of land and they often gave them a tract of land on the frontier. And the most susceptible frontier was the northeastern part of Italy. They're protected by water and by mountains, but in the northeastern part, there's a gap between the mountains and the sea. And so they stationed a lot of their retired soldiers in that area and gave them land. And so if someone invaded Italy from that area, <laughs> you had an instant army of people not only trained and hardened, but defending their homes and their families. We have an army of Christians who have a lifetime of experience and we need them on the forefront of the battle. We don't need to retire them, we don't need to set them back, we need to train them and teach them and equip them and give them opportunities to use what God has given them over a lifetime. And, and Stuart and Cecilia have demonstrated so much foresight and so much faith in recognizing that and, and, and equipping our retired or semi-retired Christians to do that work. And then to, to come alongside Brian and Betty and all the talents that they add to the program. Uh, it's just an incredible couple and we bonded with them instantly. And I don't even have to explain to you what it means to be teaching alongside Ed and Nat. Talk about a humbling honor to be teaching alongside them that you understand that. And so it is a humbling honor that Amy and I will be working with the Senior AIM program here. And as we go along, I'll explain a little bit of our, of our background. I'll begin, well, first of all, we're going to be studying first 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, verse 1. But I want to go back to the last years Amy and I had in college at Southwestern Oklahoma State University. It was Southwestern State College back then in Weatherford, Oklahoma. We had our life planned out. It was all a done deal. I was the acting editor at the the publisher had already started talking to us about taking over the newspaper. Uh, Southwestern has one of the best teaching training programs in the country. <coughs> and so it's hard to get a teaching job in Weatherford, Oklahoma. But there was an elementary school where Amy had done her student teaching. The principal was a member of the church. The superintendent was a friend of mine. It was a done deal. And we were going to live in Weatherford, Oklahoma for the rest of our lives. I was going to run the newspaper and she was going to teach school. <laughs> we listened to the radio report the next morning at, after the school board meeting and the superintendent said they just rubber stamp what he recommends. We would listen to the radio program the next morning and the high school wanted to hire a football coach and he would only need more volume back there. He, he would only take the job if they had an elementary job for his wife. And that was the end of that plan. <laughs> and so we uh, I'll get this going. Sometimes it backs out on me. And I will start up again. Don't you love technology? <laughs> and so instead of spending the rest of our lives in Weatherford, Oklahoma, we moved to the Navajo Reservation and taught school there for four years on the Navajo Reservation. And that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But as we did this. This is not going to cooperate, is it? Uh, 
as we did this, we were reminded that God's grace is sufficient. We had our plans all worked out, and, and God told us, not he didn't tell us, but we understood, <laughs> that we had good plans, but he had better ones. You know, when we say something is sufficient or adequate, if you would invite us over to your home for food, and we'd say, well, that meal was adequate, <laughs> you probably wouldn't be real impressed with that response, that, that the meal was adequate. But in a scriptural sense, that word means it's good for its purpose. It did what it was supposed to do. A little bit later in 2 Corinthians, you'll be studying chapter 12 and verse 9, where it says, and he has said to me, to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfect, perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So God says that his grace is sufficient. We move from Arizona back to Yukon, Oklahoma. Excellent, outstanding congregation, a great group of God's people. We had a, two young twin daughters brand new three-bedroom brick house, a brand, brand new Oldsmobile station wagon. Amy had a good teaching job, and I was teaching elementary art, probably the top position in my field in the country. I won't go into the details, but Mustang Valley was a little rural school district with a ton of money. Back when schools were cutting their budgets for art, music, and PE, they built a whole new building for art, music, and PE, and I designed my own room. A big room plus three other rooms, and I had it made for life. I was set. We, we were going to be there in Yukon, Oklahoma for the rest of our lives. Our, our small groups, our life groups, one of the things they did was they wrote letters to missionaries they supported. And so we wrote a letter to the Chisholms in Pescata, Italy, and they wrote back and said, we need workers over here. Why don't you come help us? <laughs> we were 28 years old and naive. We thought it was a serious question. Well. We have the best jobs in our field. We have a three-bedroom brick house. We have a brand new Oldsmobile station wagon. We have two little daughters. We can't think of any good reason why we don't go over there and help you. And so we did, and we moved to, from Yukon to Italy. Oops. And we were reminded once again that God's grace is sufficient. We were in Italy for seven years. And then we moved back to the United States, and we moved to Watertown, South Dakota. And what we wanted was a place, the, a good place to rear our children. There's no better place in the country than Watertown, South Dakota, to rear your children, unless it's Lubbock, Texas. But <laughs> now, and by the way, as I talk about these congregations, I can tell you that, that Sunset has no, no apologies to make to any congregation, because the family here at, at Sunset is outstanding. And so when I say that the church in... Yukon was great. It is great, but that, that's no slight on the church here because we have found this to be one of the most incredible families of God's people anywhere, and we've traveled around a little bit. We spent 23 years in Watertown, South Dakota, and then we decided we need to get closer to my parents. My, my dad died in the meantime, but we can get closer to my mother. And so we, we moved to McPherson, Kansas. McPherson, Kansas has the best congregation of God's people. <laughs> We had a two-story Victorian mansion with an attic and a basement and a shop. Actually, there were four rooms in the shop and a two-car garage. We were going to die there. <laughs> we were set to die there. And then Tim, Tim calls us toward the end of last year, and he says, would you consider working with the Senior Adventures Admissions and Ministry Program? And I said, do we have to move? He said, yeah, I think that's part of it. And so we decided that was the right thing to do, and we were reminded once again that God's grace is sufficient. And God's grace is a wonderful thing, and it, it's good to talk in this chapter about God's grace because it is a very special thing. We talk sometimes about grace and mercy as if they're the same thing, but they're the same thing but opposite. They're two sides of the same coin. Now, mercy is when we don't receive what we deserve. What do we deserve? We, we, we deserve condemnation, right? And so by God's mercy, he does not give us what we deserve. Grace is a gift, and by God's grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. What do we not deserve? 
salvation, eternal life. We do not deserve those things. And so they're two sides of the same coin, so they're the same but opposite. I'm sure you want to remember that. The Greek word for grace is efkari. Oops. I just flinch a little bit in this mouse because when we were living in Italy, we went to uh, Athens for the Mediterranean lectureship. As we traveled down Grace, we didn't want to seem like we were totally rude, and so we wanted to learn some basic Greek words, and one of the main ones we wanted to learn was thank you. The Greek word for, for thank you is efkaristo, and if you look at that word, you see karis in the middle of that, and that's the Greek word for a gift. And it's interesting to me that the word for a gift has been transformed into our response to that gift. And so karis is the gift, and our response to that gift is efkaristo. Why do we say grace at the table? That seems weird, doesn't it, to say grace at the table? Do you know why we say grace at the table? That's our response to what God has given us. Now, some denominations, of course, have taken that word and made it into the word Eucharist. And I would not recommend that we start using the word Eucharist because it's not a New Testament word, but it's good for us to understand where that word came from. And the word Eucharist comes from the Greek word for thank you because of your gift to us. And so as we take the Lord's Supper, we need to be reminded that we're saying thank you for what he has done for us. Some of you have seen the musical Les Mis, Les Miserables, and Jean Valjean is in prison for stealing a loaf of bread. He shouldn't have been put there. He needed to feed his family. But he escaped from a work detail and ended up in the, the home of a bishop. And he thanked the bishop by stealing some of his silver. And when the police brought him back, the bishop should have said, throw him in, in prison because now he deserves to go to prison. It's not because he stole a loaf of bread to feed his family, but he stole my silver when I'd given him my hospitality. But instead, he told the, the police that he had given the silver to Jean Valjean. And what he was doing when he did that was he was giving him, he said he was giving him to God. And Jean Valjean, for the rest of his life, helped people. That's what he did, was he devoted the rest of his life to helping people because of the grace extended to him by that bishop. He turned around and, and used that in his life. And that's what we want to do as we think about this chapter of receiving God's grace well. I just want to add an aside that there are some unfortunate chapter breaks in the Bible. I know this is news to you. <laughs> there is an unfortunate chapter break between 5 and 6 because if you don't back up to chapter 5, chapter 6, verse 1 doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And there is an unfortunate chapter break between chapters 6 and 7 because chapter 7, verse 1 is in this, this lesson today because it fits with chapter 6. And I won't say more about the person who chose that. I don't know. I, I understand that it had something to do with riding a horse, and every time the horse hit a bump, they'd make a new chapter or something like that. <laughs> but uh, one indicator of a bad chapter break is if it starts with a word like and, therefore, but, so forth. And you know that, that some of the biggest words in the, in the New Testament are the little ones, so-and-so, but, so-and-so, and, and we talked last week, I think, about so-and-so, therefore. There are chapters that if I mention the chapter, something pops into your mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What word pops into your mind? Love. If I say Hebrews 11, you say faith. If I say Hebrews chapter 12, it begins with the word therefore. And so if you know Hebrews chapter 11, chapter 12 starts with a therefore. And so if you don't get the therefore, you really didn't get the point of chapter 11. And so these words are significant. Now, God's grace is sufficient, but, but we need to treat it right, and we need to do the right things with it. So to understand chapter 6, we need to back up to chapter 5. Beginning in verse 14 of chapter 5, he says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. 
Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of God, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become righteousness of God in him. The last part of chapter 5 describes what kind of Christians we should be, uh, what's expected of us, and how we should follow God. And so then we begin chapter 6. Now the writer of our material suggests a couple of things that God is doing in this chapter and a few things that we are doing in this chapter. One of the things that God is doing in chapter 6 is he is making an appeal for believers to receive his grace well. And so we need to keep that in mind as we look at these first few, vas few verses. Now, I, I think there's nothing wrong with us applying these verses to non-believers. I think it's right for us to say now is the acceptable time for salvation and so forth. But he's also talking about believers, about Christians, and about how they deal with God's grace. So I think it's correct to apply it in both situations, in the non-believers and believers. But in context, it may be more for believers than for non-believers. A few verses later, God is providing his power for believers to receive his grace well. And then toward the end of the chapter, God has made his dwelling place among believers. And so those are things that God is doing throughout this, this chapter. There are also some things that are expected of us, and these are the things we want to focus on because it's our, it's our response, it's our, it's our reaction to what God has done. The first two verses, we work with God to make an appeal for believers to receive his grace well. God wants us to receive his grace well, but we join with him in, in accomplishing that. He wants us to, to join him in that appeal. And so the first verse, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What does it mean to do something in vain? To receive his grace in vain, what does, what does that involve? How can we receive his, his grace in vain? Uh, Thayer's Dictionary defines that as empty, devoid of truth. Speaking of places or vessels, it's something that have nothing in them. You have a container and it's empty. Of people, it is empty-handed <coughs> or without a gift. Metaphorically, it's someone who is destitute of spiritual wealth, someone who boasts of his faith as a transcendent possession, yet is without the fruits of faith. They talk a good game, but they don't have anything to back it up. And then metaphorically of endeavors, labors, acts which result in nothing, vain, fruitless, without effect, vain to no purpose. We have learned, a, Amy and I have learned a new word recently as we've been moving. It's an old word, but we don't use it anymore. It's called spuddle. Any of you heard the word spuddle? It's being busy doing nothing. <laughs> and we do that a lot. We do this and this and this and this, and we realize we haven't really accomplished anything and so to receive God's grace in vain it's it's spuddle we're just we're just talking about it but we're not really doing anything if you back up to chapter 5 again this tells us who we should be and how we should receive his his grace back in verses 14 and 15 for the love of Christ controls us having concluded this that one died for all therefore all died and he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. That should be our response to God's grace. It should transform us. It should change us into this kind of person. We're not living for ourselves anymore, but we're living for God. The, the, the writer of our material said that grace directs a person's life upward, not inward. And that's how we should receive God's grace, to move us upward. And then the next verse in chapter 6 it says, for you, this is a parenthetical phrase there. You notice that verse 1 ends with those dashes. And so this is, this is the, 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 the reason behind what he's saying. Because it words, begins with the word for. And he quotes the Old Testament. For he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. 
Behold, now is the day of salvation. And he's referring to Isaiah chapter 49 and, and verse 8, where God says, In a favorable time I have answered you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you, and I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to restore the land, to make them inherit the desolate heritages. And so God back there in Isaiah said, in a favorable time, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. And, and Paul is quoting that here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, I did it at the acceptable time. Now, we sometimes look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 7. It says, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And I think correctly, we interpret that to be at the right time in history. Right there in the Roman Empire where people spoke Greek and the roads were there to move uh, for a Roman citizen to travel all over the world. I think that it is... That's what it's talking about in the fullness of time. But in a sense, too, there is a, an acceptable time that's not tied to history. It's tied to our own lives. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, Jesus came at the right point in history, but as far as your life is concerned, the right time for him to do what he did was when you needed it. And Jesus died for you at that point in your, in your life when you had no other hope. And it, the, the writer suggests that we work with God to make an appeal for believers to receive his grace well in those first two verses. And then he goes on in verses 3, to ten, three through 10 and, and summarizes it this way. We make every effort to make God look good to others. How can we make God look good? How can we make God look bad? Sometimes we do more of the bad than the good. We've all heard of people who say, well, I'm not going to go to church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. Or I know so-and-so. And a lot of times they, they point to the preacher and say, look at the preacher. And I'm better than he is. And so why should I go there? Of course, they're just making excuses. We all know that. But that's what people do sometimes. So how can we make God look bad? We go out there and, and live the kind of lives that Christians shouldn't live, and they say, well, that's what a Christian is. Why should I bother? I'm better than that. I live a better life than that. And we, make, we don't realize we're making God look bad, and we're making Jesus, making Jesus look bad. We're making the church look bad. Someday when I have a lot of extra time on my hands, I'm going to write a book about Christ clothing himself in us. You know, we talk about clothing ourselves in Christ. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus clothes himself with us? What feet does Jesus have in the world today? What hands does he have? What mouth does he have in the world today? And so it's up to us to make Jesus look good. It's up to us to make God look good. And that's what Paul deals with in these next few verses as we go through chapter 6 here of 2 Corinthians. Verse 3 says, Giving no cause for offense in anything in order that the ministry may not be discredited. Giving no cause for offense in anything. A few chapters later, in chapters eight, chapter 8, you're going to see we, Paul say, as he's talking about the collection that they've taken up, we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And back in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature in favor with God and man. And so Jesus, he didn't compromise, but as much as was possible, he was acceptable to, to humans, to people. And so we can make God look good or we can make God look bad. We can make Jesus look good or we can make it, him look bad. We can make the church look good or make the church look bad. And it's up to us to try to, to do our best to make God look good. He says so that the ministry may not be discredited. What, what ministry is he talking about? Now, if you back up to chapter 15, he's just said in the previous chapter 
Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against, the, against them, and he has committed us to us the word of reconciliation. So in chapter 6, where he talks about the, the ministry, it's this ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. And so that, that's the ministry that we have. Why do we need a ministry of reconciliation? Because we're not reconciled. What does it mean to reconcile something? To bring together. You have two, two parties that are separated, and you have a reconciliation to try to bring them back together. In just a little bit, we'll see one of the passages that indicates why that is, that we need a, a reconciliation. He goes on there in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And he says, But in everything commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in affliction, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger. In chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is going to say, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I'm more so. In far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. And so when Paul mentions the things that he has suffered for the gospel, he's not kidding. This is how he responds to God's grace. This is the kind of life that he lives in response to God's grace. He also says there in chapter 6, we do it as servants of God. Romans tells us that we are all enslaved to something. And we like to say, I'm free. I'm, I'm not enslaved to anything. The Jews like to say that, didn't they? Why do you say we need to be set free? We have never been enslaved to anybody. There's nobody who's been more enslaved than, than the Jewish nation. They were born in slavery. They started out in slavery, and they came out of slavery, and then they were they were enslaved to the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and the Romans. When they said that they weren't enslaved to anybody, they were subject to the Roman government. And we do the same thing, don't we? We say, I'm not enslaved to anything. I don't need to be set free because I'm not enslaved to anything. But Paul tells us in Romans that we are all enslaved to sin or righteousness. And we need to realize that. The choice is not whether or not we are enslaved. It is to what we're going to be enslaved. And we choose whether we are enslaved to righteousness or to sin. And Paul says that we are servants. We serve God. We are enslaved to him. Then he says we do that with endurance. That's an interesting word of the New Testament, endurance. In James chapter 1, Paul says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, when you see that word perfect, it, it, it bothers us sometimes because no, none of us is perfect. But it means complete. It means that we have reached a level of, of maturity. And so in that sense, we can be perfect, not that we have a sinless life, but we have gained that level of maturity. And whatever we do gain, it's all thanks to God and what he does in our lives. We mentioned Hebrews chapter 12 a few minutes ago. Chapter 11, the, the chapter of faith, and chapter 12 begins with the word, therefore. If that's true, if that's true about those heroes of faith, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. I think it's here that that word author and perfecter of faith, the word author there actually means a pioneer. It makes me think of uh, Daniel Boone, the first one through the wilderness. He's, he sets the way, he goes through the wilderness and he, he leads the other people through there. And so the author doesn't mean he just wrote it down. He is the originator of faith and the perfecter of faith. But he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So what does that mean? Is almost okay? You know, I was a good Christian for a couple of years, and I put everything into it, and then I'm just going to kind of slide on in. We're expected to run our race with endurance, and that's one of the many wonderful things about that, that Senior Adventures in Ministry program is that it helps Christians do that and make it to the finish line strong. And if you're running a race and you, and you let up the last however many yards, everybody's going to pass you by. And we need to be prepared to, to sprint to the finish line so we can receive that, that crown. And so Paul says that he has gone through afflictions, he's gone through hardships, he's gone through distresses, he's gone through beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, sleeplessness, and hunger. And we don't have records of all those things. We have records of, of some of them. We have the beatings that he received. One time he was left for dead. We have him beaten and thrown into prison in Philippi. Uh, we, as one of the other passages mentioned, we see him in the sea as the, there's a shipwreck. But we don't have accounts of all of these events. And so Paul experienced a lot of things that we don't have. All right, the book of Acts is, is misnamed. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. And it should be, it's to be too long, but it should be some of, the attack, some of the acts of a few of the apostles. Because you have Peter in the first part of it, and Paul in the second part of it, but Andrew, I know what James did, but Andrew, John, all these other, they were just taking a rest, right? God told every one of them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I can promise you that Peter and then later Paul were not the only ones who fulfilled that. And so what you have in your hand is a few of the acts, some of the acts of a few of the apostles. And so we don't have all these events, but I know they happened because Paul said that he experienced them. And then the next verse in chapter 6 says, In purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love. And notice how he changes tones here. The first part is the, the things that he has suffered the negative things he'd have suffered. But now he's switching to some positive things. Purity, knowledge, patience, kindness. And so he, he's, he lists them this way. I've done it in purity. I've done it with, uh, with a pure life. In knowledge. And there again, that's one of the incredible things about the, the Senior Adventures program is it's, it's knowledge-based. It is an opportunity to study God's word and keep studying God's word and keep studying God's word and never let up. You can never know too much of God's word. We never get to the point where we say, well, I, I guess I figured it all out. You, you've all experienced that the more you read God's word, the more you find that you didn't really know before and you learn something new. You'd think you would have learned it by now, but no. And so we grow in knowledge. We need to grow in patience. That's hard for some of us to do, and kindness. It's all because of the Holy Spirit, and it is done in genuine love. What does genuine mean? It's not fake. It's not feigned. It's not disguised. We don't hide it. We love each other. We tell each other we love each other. It is sincere. We are sincere. When I say I love you, then I mean it, and it's not something that I'm just saying to be heard. Then... In verse 7, in the first part of verse 8, there in, in chapter 6, he continues, In the word of truth and the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report. And there he begins with the word of truth. 
Paul says in Romans that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul says that God has chosen through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And as we look through the different accounts of the human, or the human, the, the, the spiritual armor, the Christian armor, notice how the word fits into all of those. It's a sword, and it is our sword, and it is the word of truth that allows us to receive God's grace well by the power of God. If you will indulge me to take a little bit of a tangent here, I'll, I'll be back. Sometimes I, I go off, but I usually make it back. I have a string of passages marked in my, in my Bible that begins actually with Romans chapter 15, and it is a reminder that whatever we do, it's all by God's grace. Whatever we do, it's because of God and not because of us. And that the chain in, in my Bible begins in Romans chapter 15 and verse 18, where Paul says, For I will presume, not presume, to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. Shouldn't that be what we all say? I will not speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. And then earlier in 2 Corinthians in chapter 3, Paul says, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And Paul says here, we are not adequate in ourselves. And as I was preparing this lesson, I was struck from, by the the fact that most of these passages are from 2 Corinthians. You may have discovered that the Bible is an incredible book. And some of our most incredible passages come from very troubled congregations. I don't know if there's a congregation more troubled than Corinth. And when you stop and think of the beautiful passages we get from, from 1 and 2 Corinthians, it's just amazing. And the, most of this chain goes through 2 Corinthians. In chapter 4, then, of 2 Corinthians, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Christ's sake. And six chapters later, in chapter 10, but he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord, not, for not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. In the following chapter, in verse 30, if I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to to my weakness. And then in the following chapter, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, on behalf of such a man, and Paul's talking about the visions he's seen and so forth, on behalf of such a man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I shall not be foolish, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one may credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan, to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he has said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He does continue this on past 2 Corinthians into Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, where he says, But, but may it never be that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. And then in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And so whatever we do, whatever we accomplish, it is by the power of God and the power of Jesus. Our weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. A little bit later, he's going to say, in chapter 10, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. He does it in the word of truth by the power of God with weapons of righteousness in glory and dishonor. And 
the glory we have comes from God. We may receive dishonor from men, but we receive glory from God, an evil report and good report. He goes on in chapter 6, then, from the last second part of chapter, verse 8 through 10. Regarded as, as deceivers are yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet made many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. And notice how he pairs these things together with that word yet, as this way, yet that way. And he says regarded as. It doesn't mean he necessarily was this way, but this is how he was looked at and how he really was, as deceivers and yet true. We need to always speak the truth, speak the truth in love, but what we say needs to always be the truth. Now, the people out there may not accept it as the truth. They may think that we're making it up. They may think that, that, we're, that we're not telling the truth, but we are always telling the truth, no matter how they regard us. As unknown, yet well-known. It's such a wonderful thing in the world to be unknown. But it's not a good thing to not be known by God. Sometimes I might suggest that you write something on your mirror with your lipstick, but you're going to run out of room because I have a, a bunch of favorite passages in the New Testament. And Galatians is one of the top 27 books in the New Testament. And so this, I, I love this passage. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? There are a lot of people out there who claim to know God. It's another thing for God to know us. And that's a wonderful thing. If God knows us, he knows his children and he knows who we are. And so we are regarded as deceivers yet true, unknown yet well known by God as dying Yet behold, we live, because we are the ones who have eternal life. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul says this about the faithfulness of, of his co-workers. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. That's, we know we have eternal life. We know we have life after this life. But even in this life, we really live when we see each other obeying God. That is what makes us really, really live. As punished, but not put to death. As sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Poor yet making many rich, is having nothing but possessing all things. You see, possession is not a matter of a lot, it's a matter, a matter of enough. It's a matter of being satisfied with what we have, no matter if it's a little or a lot. As long as we control it and it does not control us, that is the key to possessions. And so we can have nothing but possess all things. And so at the beginning of the chapter, we work with God to make an appeal for believers to receive his grace well. Then we make every effort to make God look good to others. And then the last part of the chapter, we do not get into partnerships with those who reject God. What time am I supposed to quit? At 10 o'clock? 10.05? So I have five more minutes. It's going to be it's going to be one of those rapid deals. In these last verses, 11 through 13, it says, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. You're not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own, own affections. Now in a like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us also. Paul says, I've been open with you, I've been honest with you, so please do the same for me. Be open with me, be, be honest with me. Then verses 14 through 16, do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
He says, do not be unequally yoked. We're familiar with that phrase, probably going back to King James. Now, that does not mean that we separate ourselves from the world. We create a monastery and we move in there and we don't associate with them. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, he's talking about this brother who was living with his father's wife. I wrote you in my letter, and so I guess 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians, isn't it? I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he should be an immoral person or covetous or covetous, or idolater or reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And so he's talking about being, being unequally yoked with unbelievers and un, even unequally yoked with, with people who claim to be believers. Second John verses 9 through 11 is a very powerful passage. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. We are not to be unequally yoked with those who do not follow God. And then he says that we are the temple of the living God, and God says, I will dwell in them. You know what God has wanted since the beginning? He's an association with us. He wants to be close with us. Why, why did he miss Adam and Eve in the garden? Because he was looking for them. He was in the habit of walking and talking with Adam and Eve in the garden, and they're hiding. He says, where are you? And so they have broken that that relationship back in exodus as they're uh, as they're leaving egypt he says i will dwell among the sons of israel and i will be their god and they shall know that i am the lord their god who brought them out of the land of egypt that i might dwell among them i am the lord their god he says something similar in leviticus about making his dwelling among them ezekiel he talks about making a covenant of peace an everlasting covenant creating a sanctuary in jeremiah he oops he says that I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Well, why is it not that case? In Isaiah 59, 1, he says that the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And so that's the problem, is our sins made that separation. The last two verses in 2 Corinthians 6, encourage us to come out from their midst and be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. Back in Romans chapter 8, it talks about us being adopted as children. We can cry out, Abba, Father, because he has given us a spirit of adoption. And so we work with God to make an appeal for believers to receive his grace well. We make every effort to make God look good to others. We do not get into partnerships with those who reject God. And then verse 1 of chapter 7 fits in with chapter 6. We work toward complete holiness in our lives. He says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. We're familiar with the passage in, first, or in Galatians chapter 1. Even though we are an angel, preach you a different gospel, let him be accursed. And so, God is making his appeal for believers to receive his grace well. He provides his power for believers to receive his grace well. He makes his, his dwelling among believers. But we participate in what God is doing. We work with him to make that appeal. We make every effort to make God look good to others. We do not get into partnerships with those who reject God. Oops. And we work toward complete holiness in our lives. So as we, as we leave today, ask ourselves, how have I experienced God's grace? Now, we can all answer, uh, give a general answer to that. We, we've, we've experienced Christ. We've experienced salvation. But each one of us in our, in our individual lives, we have experienced God's grace on an individual basis. And so think about, think about how have I experienced God's grace and how have we responded to that, gr to that grace? We, he has undoubtedly given us grace, so what have we done in response? And the question, I think, of, of first Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is, when's the right time to receive God's grace well?
behold, now is the accepted time. We made it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. One thing about it, I'll never have to worry about forgetting his name since I'm a Gary also. <laughs> we have a, a few prayer requests. One is to pray for the family of Chris Ford, who passed away during an LCU trip to Israel. Now, that's, that's one way to, ooh, that's not a good, good situation for everybody on that. And we need to pray for Elias Her Herrera, his three-year-old daughter was shot in the head and is at Lakeside Covenant Children's Hospital. And we need to pray for the elder selection, the, the, the folks in Ukraine, and also the folks in Uvalde. And this also says to, to pray for the folks in Uvalde. And then we need a prayer of thanks for Martha Wharton and her improved health. So that's a nice way to uh, end the announcements. And at this time, Scott Rainey will lead us in our closing prayer. Dear God, we come before you and all of your greatness and your mightiness and your love and compassion for us and we just ask that as we strive to serve you during our lives here on this earth that we will do so in a way that will be pleasing to you and we just ask for your strength in doing that. There are so many uh, people that are suffering and are having problems and we just ask that you uh, extend your love and comfort to them and help them to get through their uh, various problems that they have. It is unimaginable that a person can have hate uh, in their lives enough to do the horrible things that uh, happened in New Valley, and we just uh, ask your richest blessings on all those that are suffering and just give them comfort and strength uh, to be able to uh, get, get through that and endure it. We just continually thank you for the life that you provided for us and we're all so richly blessed. And just continue to go with us. And it's his name we ask. Amen. <laughs>